Suppose we start in Canberra and we take a big trip across the Pacific Ocean to the United States. And on the west coast of the United States in Washington State is a place called Hanford. Now the Hanford site is famous for the, being the place where the Americans made plutonium to put in the first nuclear weapons. Now it's a big nuclear waste dump and you can still take a tour of it, I gather. Nearby is a far safer scientific facility. This is a giant Michelson interferometer. That white building there contains a beam splitter and a laser. The laser is split into two parts. One is sent along this four kilometer long pipe that's pumped down to a high vacuum. The other part of the laser is sent along this other four kilometer long pipe, which is at right angles. The lasers bounce off mirrors at the ends of the pipe and recombine at the beam splitter to form the interferometer. This is what it kind of looks like on the inside. There's the laser bouncing off the mirrors. And what we're detecting here with this interferometer is relative motion of the two mirrors. The light, which is split in half by the beam splitter, travels along to the mirrors and bounces off the mirrors. And because the distance the light travels depends on how far these mirrors are away, the interference condition will change depending on the relative length of the arms of the Michelson. So if these two mirrors start moving, then we see constructive and destructive interference of the laser at the output over there on the right-hand side. If everything's perfectly aligned, we would see the light flashing on and off as these mirrors move backwards and forwards. So what is the point of this giant Michelson interferometer in the desert in Washington state? The point is to detect gravitational waves. This animation shows rippling of space and time as a neutron star spirals around a black hole and approaches closer and closer and eventually the two collide and annihilate. Well, rather the black hole eats a neutron star, I suppose. Now this rippling of space and time can move the mirrors of the Michelson interferometer and this way we can observe a gravitational wave. The catch is that over the four kilometers of this Michelson interferometer, the relative distance of the two mirrors will change by about 10 to the minus 20 meters. That is a really small number. The Michelson interferometers can be phenomenally sensitive. What we're going to do now is calculate how Michelson interferometer works and see just how good the LIGO interferometer is. We've seen how big an interferometer can get. Now let's have a look inside and see what makes it tick. On one side, we have a light source. We're going to consider the light source to be a single frequency of light, a laser. You can use other sources of light in interferometers. A white light interferometer is super interesting and actually really useful. But we're going to think about a single color of light for now. Um, it's the easiest way to, to run through the calculations, basically. So we have an input beam here. It's split into two. It might be exactly half. It might not. Actually, one of the advantages of Michelson is it doesn't matter so much if it's not exactly a 50-50 split of the beam splitter. Either way, we have two paths, two different Michelson arms going to two different mirrors, and the light is reflected back from these mirrors towards the beam splitter, which gives two outputs to the Michelson. One is this reflected output beam that comes down here, and there's also light that can be reflected back toward the laser. What we're going to do now is calculate the output beam. We're going to calculate how much light comes out down here. So now it's time to do a calculation of how the Michelson works. We're starting with some light here. We're going to call the field of this light, the optical field, E in. It's coming into the interferometer through a beam splitter where it's split in half. Some of it goes up to this mirror here, some gets transmitted. That light's reflected from the mirrors back to the beam splitter where some is reflected and some is transmitted. And the resulting fields that come out, we've got a reflected field here and an output field here. We just call this one reflected because it's coming back in the direction where the input came from. The arms of the interferometer have lengths L1 and L2, so I'll refer to this as arm 1 and arm 2. And I'm going to redraw the system just by displacing the beams on return to the beam splitter. That's totally fine. You can build an interferometer exactly like this. It's just easier to analyze because now the place where the beams come back and interfere is just a bit offset and we can see better, be better what's happening. Okay. The other important thing to realize is that because the light travels around this path, this um, arm one and arm two, as it travels along this path, it accumulates a phase. As you travel along a wave, the phase changes. And we have a, phi, a phase phi 1, phase phi 2 for the two arms. 
Now you can consider this in two different ways. One would be to follow along the length of this arm as you travel, a distance L1 here and a distance L2 here, and then back again, so 2L1 and 2 times L2. And then you say the phase change as you travel along that length is K times the length, so 2K L1 and 2K L2. That would be the, ph the phases phi1 and phi2 in terms of K and length. Alternatively, you could sit here and say, how long does the light take to travel to this mirror and back again? And then we have a time T2 and a time T1 for each of the arms. And the accumulated phase then would be the frequency omega times the time. So you can calculate the phase using the time it takes for the light to leave the beam splitter and return back, or the length times uh, k. Either is fine, but don't do both. Just choose one or the other. All right, now beam splitter has the following important properties. We have light coming into the beam splitter and some being reflected, some being transmitted. The light that's transmitted off this front surface of the mirror will give the phase um, a phase of pi, so negative r. So it's got an amplitude reflection coefficient of negative r, an amplitude transmission coefficient of t. That means that there's a phase shift between the transmitted and reflected light of 180 degrees, or pi. The relationship between r and t is given by this, so the square of r plus the square of t must be equal to 1. And this is all about energy conservation. Now light coming back from the other side, well, in this case, if it's reflected off this side, the reflection coefficient is positive, and so there's no phase shift between the transmitted and reflected fields when it comes and bounces off the other side of the mirror. And this is a property that's required for conservation of energy. Now, the light that comes back from this direction is the field E2, which has a phase shift phi2 because it's traveled this arm of the interferometer. And so the field that's reflected and transmitted here will be E2 times R and E2 times T, where E2 is given by all of this in terms of E1. We can do exactly the same thing for the light that comes back from arm 1. It will hit the beam splitter, some is reflected, some is transmitted. And on this side we get a negative R, on this side we get a positive T. And now all we have to do to find the interference, that is the total amplitude of these waves, is add these amplitudes up to find the total amplitude and then to find the amount of light, the power of light, we take the absolute square of those amplitudes. So now we're going to add up these amplitudes. So E out um, down here, this E out down here, um, is given by the sum of R times E2 and T times E1, where E2 and E1 are these fields that are coming back from the arm. And as I've said, the fields E1 and E2 can be written in terms of a phase shift and the original input field and the reflection transmission coefficients. So you can follow that through. We can rewrite this sum. Um, so, sorry, I left a 1 here. Forget about that 1. That shouldn't be there. So we can rewrite that in terms of E in, R and T, and just these complex exponentials here with the phase shifts phi2 and phi1. I can take out a factor of phi2 here and then express this just in terms of the phase difference, a delta phi, phi2 minus phi1. And this is an interesting way or useful way of writing it because it really shows you that the interference pattern here depends on the relative phase phi2 and phi1. It just, we don't care what the the total values of phi1 and phi2 are, we're just comparing them. So this phase factor that comes out the front here, when we take the absolute square, it'll go away. And so all we're left with is a, a relative phase. To calculate the intensity or the power at the output, we take the absolute square, and to do that we need to find uh, the absolute square of this complex number. So I've expanded the complex exponential here in terms of cosine and sine, then I square the real part and the imaginary part, which is where this expression comes from. And so finally I get an expression for the output power or intensity, which goes like 1 minus the cosine of a delta phi, where delta phi is phi 2 minus phi 1. And that's the power at the output of the interferometer, and we can see that as we change the phase, we'll change the intensity. The last thing we have to do is relate the phase shift that we derived previously back to the arm lengths L1 and L2. So here's the expression for the output power, or output intensity. It's uh, given by something that's proportional to 1 minus cosine of the phase difference, phi 2 minus phi 1. You sometimes also see this written as a sine squared function, which you can get using this trig ID here.
Okay, so what about the phases? Well, for the path length L1, we can just say that the accumulated phase shift, if you follow the wave around, is just given by the distance times the k. So k is 2 pi on lambda, the distance is 2 times L, so phi 1 is 4 pi L1 on lambda. And it's similar for phi 2. Of course, if we dunk the whole thing in water, then lambda would become shorter by a factor of the refractive, refractive index, but we're assuming here we're dealing with a refractive index of 1. So we can substitute in these values for phi 1 and phi 2 and find an expression for the output power as a function of L2 minus L1. So what we see here, if, if this path length is exactly the same, then sine squared of uh, 0 is 0, and um, we have no output power. But if the path length varies by just a quarter of a wavelength, then we would have a pi on 2 here, which gives us a sine squared of 1, which would be the maximum intensity. And as you vary L1, L2, they don't have to be exactly the same or even close to the same, you will pass through fringes of bright and dark every quarter of a wavelength. And so in this way, the wavelength of light becomes a tick on an optical ruler. What is meant by that is that as you vary the relative lengths L1, L2, for example, if a gravitational wave is going past and this mirror moves a bit further away from this beam splitter, then you're comparing that length, that change in length, to the wavelength of light. Now, if the wavelength of light here is, let's say, for a one micron wavelength that they use in a gravitational wave detector, that's 10 to the minus 6 meters, then you'll go from a full bright fringe through a dark fringe and back to a full bright fringe in half a wavelength, which is half a micron. So that's a, a, a pretty good ruler. We can easily determine distances much less than half a micron by measuring changes of intensity sort of fractionally as this moves. But that's a far cry from where we want to be with LIGO. So remember, we're trying to measure a change in path length between L2 and L1 of something like 10 to the minus 20 meters, which is a good number of orders of magnitude different to where we are with 10 to the minus 6 meters or so. How do we get all of those orders of magnitude back? Well, there are a lot of other tricks in the LIGO interferometer that we haven't included here. The light doesn't just bounce to this mirror and back to this beam splitter. There's actually a, another mirror here and another mirror here that recycles the light backwards and forwards along these arms and amplifies the change in length, that's the signal from the change in length as the light circulates around and around. There's another mirror here that reflects power back into the interferometer to increase the amount of light. There's another mirror here that uh, also reflects light back into the interferometer. The whole thing is extremely complicated with mirrors all over the place. But the point is that by building these kinds of devices, you can achieve extraordinary sensitivity to changes in length. Um, and incredibly, we can measure these ripples in space and time. So that entire discussion of the Michelson interferometer is correct if we assume plane waves. That is, the phase of the wave is constant across the face of the wave. In that case, when we look at the light coming out here, all the way across the, the face of the light, you see it changing from bright to dark uniformly. Often, if you do this experiment, however, you see something that is not uniform. For example, this image up here could show the output of the interferometer as measured with a camera down here, and you see circles of bright and dark fringes going from um, as you move from the center of the beam out to the outside. And this kind of behavior is caused by spherical wavefronts. So let's imagine we have a point source of light here, and this is going to be emitting spherical wavefronts that travel into the interferometer. They go out to the mirrors, and they bounce back, and then they interfere. Now, if these two spheres come back exactly the same size, then you'll get complete uniform interference here because the, the, the spheres match up. But let's imagine that L2 and L1 are not quite the same length. That means one of these spheres has had time to get a little bit bigger, and so when they interfere here, you have two spheres interfering with each other that are different sizes. So the phase will vary as you go across the beam. So when curved wavefronts enter the interferometer, there's a phase shift that varies across the beam. And we're going to suppose that the wavefronts come from a point source, and there's some path difference between 
L1 and L2 between the path of these uh, beams. That path difference is twice L1 minus L2. Then when the waves interfere, they'll have different radii of curvature. Now we're going to assume that D, this path difference, is much, much less than uh, these two lengths, L1 and L2. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. This will be how the interference looks. I've just abstracted away the interferometer. and We're looking now at two point sources, one centered here and one centered here. And because they have a different radii of curvature, when you look at the interference pattern over here, we can see that the phase between them is varied. So in this example, um, on axis here, they're always in phase. And as you move across, you see at this, this point here, there'd be 180 degrees out of phase. So here you would have constructive interference, and over here we'd have destructive interference, assuming these uh, lines represent um, uh, curves of equal phase. So let's put the distance between these two point sources as D, and we can draw a line to some point in space here. And we're going to measure the interference along this line here. We can assume there's an angle theta out to this point x, y, and theta will be approximately the same irrespective of which point source you choose because we've made d small compared to the distance that we're propagating, which is um, the l's, l1 and l2. So the change in phase, the relative change in phase between these two point sources, delta phi, will be k times the difference in the distance. So the distance from this point source out to this point here will be given by x plus d squared plus y squared to this point x, y. We've added d because it has moved further away along the axis here by the distance d. From this point source here, it'll just be square root of x squared plus y squared. And so we take the difference of those two and multiply by k to get the phase. Now we're going to do some maths just to simplify all this. So we can take out a factor of k, we'll multiply this out. We can take out a factor of the square root of x squared plus y squared. And what we've got here now is one plus something that is small because it's proportional to D on top and there's no D on the bottom. We said D is small compared to the distance out to the point X, Y. So we can use a simplification. Square root of one plus a small number is approximately equal to one plus that small number divided by two, which gives us this. And we can get rid of this D squared term because that'll be much smaller than this term here, which is proportional to X times D. And we can get rid of those 1 and minus 1, the cancel. And so finally, we get that the phase is equal to k times x times d divided by uh, square root of x squared plus y squared. We can rewrite uh, this term here as cos theta. So we end up with k times d times cos theta. So what this means is as you increase theta, you go further and further up this line here, we're going to get a change in phase. And if d is a big number, if d is a number which is much bigger than 1, for example, then as you change this angle here, theta, then the change in phase could be many, many uh, revolutions, many multiples of 2 pi. And so we get the phase changing, and we get we go fringes going from dark to bright and dark to bright and dark to bright. The reason the fringes get closer together as you move away is because of this cos theta term. It's not linear in theta. It goes as the cosine of theta. Another thing that you can see in these Michelson interferometers when they're not perfectly aligned uh, is some stripes. So something like this. And this is caused by one of the mirrors being tilted relative to the other one. So let's imagine we have a situation where as you go along in X, this is a direction in the, the plane of the interference, ideally you would have, as you go along in X, this mirror is not tilted, it would be completely perpendicular to the light that is coming in. But if it's not completely perpendicular, then as you walk along in X, you're going to get an extra path length here, delta D. And delta D can be expressed as X times tan theta for this angle here. And for small angles theta, and it's going to have to be small, otherwise you'll see no interference at all, it's going to be roughly equal to x times theta. So that's just extra path length. You can just add that to L1 or to L2. So here's our expression for the output of the interferometer, the intensity. I'm just going to add this extra path length x theta to L1, which means that the output now is going to depend on x. So as I go along in the x direction here, I'll see fringes that depend on this amount of misalignment here theta.